All right. Welcome everyone. We'll get started in just a few seconds. We're going to let everyone get into our virtual space together. We're glad you're joining us today. Well, hello everyone and welcome to NIMWA Exchange, a spin-off of the award-winning pandemic live stream series, BMA NIMWA. If you missed our first NIMWA Exchange episode about Alma Woodsy Thomas and the Little Paris Group, watch it on the museum's YouTube channel and subscribe to catch future NIMWA Exchange episodes after they air. Each month, hosts from NIMWA are joined by special guests to center women creatives. We consider topics relevant to our world and offer insights into collaborations the museum is fostering while its building is closed for renovation. During this time of change, we are excited to exchange ideas with our guests and our viewers. Today's topic is about the roles we can play to interrogate race as a social construct and to disrupt racism. We are asking, where do we go from here? And I've invited artist Jamie Parter Laura to help us explore that question. Hi, I'm Addie Gayoso, NIMWA's senior educator. And I'm Jenny Trainer, NIMWA's associate curator. And today it is really an absolute pleasure to be able to welcome back to the museum, in a manner of speaking, <laughs> Jamie. Pantera. Hi, Jamie. Hi, Jenny. Hi, Addie. So nice to be here. We're so happy to have you. I just want to tell um, our viewers a little bit about you. Jamie's work was featured at NIMWA in the exhibition Border Crossing in 2017, and we loved her so much that we wanted to bring her back and talk to her some more. Jamie is an artist based in Albuquerque, New Mexico, literally one of my favorite cities in the US. Um, and her work runs the gamut from ceramic vessels to neon signs to textiles. Through this diverse array of material, Jamie explores what lies behind many of our collective conceptions, or we could say even miscon misconceptions. In her distinctive black wear, she questions the dichotomy between the natural world and humans, well, in her latest body of work, she takes the issue of whiteness and white supremacy head on. Jamie's work is in public and private collections across the US, including the National Museum of Women and the Arts, also in Mexico, and has been featured in Art 21 magazine, American Craft, Hyperallergic, and on PBS. In 2017, Artsy named her one of the artists shaping the future of ceramics. Her exhibitions include the one at NIMWA, in 2017, the New Mexico Museum of Art in Santa Fe and Craft Contemporary in Los Angeles, California. Her fellowships include those from McDowell, Yaddo, and the Tamarind Institute. Is it Yaddo? Yaddo? Yaddo. Yaddo. <laughs> She's represented by Gerald Peters in Santa Fe and Simon Breitbart in San Francisco. Jamie, thank you so much for being here. I know it's um, a little bit earlier where you are, so we appreciate that. Yeah, thank you so much, Jamie. We're so thrilled to speak with you today and grateful for your time. Uh, Jenny and I have a few questions for you, as you know, and I'm guessing our audience might as well. So for those of you who are joining us, feel free to add your questions to the chat or the Q&A, and we will do our best to address them through our, our conversation today. So to get started, Jamie, would you mind telling us a little bit about your artistic practice and how you would describe yourself as an artist? Sure, thanks, Abby. Um, I always like to start my talks by saying that um, I'm relatively new to being an artist. I decided to go back to school to study art when I was 40 years old. And um, I say that just because I think that there are so many of us out there in the world who um, might think that it's too late to become an artist, that it's something that you need to be born with. And um, that's not been my experience that, you know, I think that it's something that can be learned. So I just always like to start with that. Um, so I consider myself a conceptual artist because ideas become come first for me. I'm interested in what art can do that other forms of discourse can't. But unlike some conceptual artists who aren't necessarily interested in process or materials, I'm very interested in what materials and methods can bring to a concept. 
I'm always looking for the metaphorical possibilities and materials, and I'm always looking forward to the generative nature of process. When I have an idea, I like to work at it from two angles, through research, mostly reading, during which I'm combing the text for images and metaphors, and through learning a new medium. Ideally, I work both of these paths independently until I find the point where they intersect. I have a friend, a playwright who I met at McDowell, who says that it's not about what needs to be said, it's about what needs to be felt. And that's mm -hmm. what I'm always after as an artist. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So Jamie, you, as you noted, um, you know, came came to your artistic practice later in life, and your your artistic career really began with these blackware vessels, and, and we're seeing an example of one of them in in um, Nimo's collection here on the on the screen. And these were the subject of the exhibition in 2017 that we had at the museum. So can you briefly tell us about them and the ideas? That, um, that lie behind them? Sure, yeah. In, in 2019, I traveled with a small group of artists to a remote stretch of the US-Mexico border. Uh, we spent a week camped in the high desert grasslands of Coronado National Forest, which are the unceded lands of the Chiricahua Apache. And I spent days walking the rolling hills of its southern extent, where the international border is marked by a low vehicle barrier. On my walks, I found so many traces of human presence, but the most common things I found were two liter bottles that had been used to carry water. In the same places, I found bottles. It's also defined pot shirts and other artifacts left by people who have passed through that place over the past several thousand years. Soon after, our group crossed the international border and traveled to Mata Ortiz, the Northern Mexican village renowned for its ceramics. Hector and Graciela Gallegos taught us how to make ceramic vessels in the same ways that they've been made in that region for thousands of years. It was there that I learned to forage and prepare clay, build with coils, and polish with stones and fire in a pit. And it was that process that I brought home for the Blackware project that we're talking about. Upon my return to New Mexico, I kept thinking about how the plastic bottle and the pot shirt are essentially the same thing. Both were precious objects vessels capable of sustaining human life. I also began to think about them as evidence of an ancient and unbroken flow of people, culture, plants, and animals that continues in spite of attempts to sever it. And so the project became, began with two simple rules. I would, one, use the oldest local ways of working with clay to make objects that, two, reference the plastic bottle, the most iconic and ubiquitous vessel of my time. So the, the sculpture that you're looking right at right now is a, a very kind of literal um, rendition of the plastic bottle, just using this other materials method and process. Um, but the majority of vessels that I've made in this series only retain the iconography of the, um, the five pointed bottom of the plastic bottle and that spiral top, which, um, I like to point out our ancient human symbols, you know, what a spiral has been used um, by humans throughout human uh, civilization as a symbol, um, as have pentagons. So it feels, um, and this time, more important than ever to talk about the borderlands as a space of continuity, flow, and connection. I think that the media's images of the apocalyptic, desertified, denuded landscape created along sections of the border wall have come to represent in the American imagination everything and everyone that lies to its south. In the human history of the region, the border is such a recent construct, both political and physical, imposed on a place that is characterized by millennia of movement of plants, animals, people, and culture. There's nothing natural or inevitable about that kind of severing. The land defies it. The unstoppable movement of people defies it. And I think it, it matters to remember that. So I wanted to just comment um, for a second on this piece that you're looking at right now, um, which is, um, I'm so happy to say, in the collection of Nimwa, and um, for me really represented a turning point in my thinking within this series. Um, I think that this is, you know, it was around this time that I really started thinking about human material culture as an extension 
of um, ourselves as, as microcosms of our values. And um, that any self, tra any transformation of our material culture, for example, our reliance on plastic bottles would also inevitably require the transformation um, of ourselves. And um, it was at that point that really the objects, I think, started becoming more like shrine objects. And I was interested in what they could do to transform our imaginations of ourselves um, and our own creativity and also our futures as, as humans on this planet. Thank you, Jamie. That's really so insightful to hear more about how these really these vessels for you have transformed over time. And I would say that, you know, one thing that really strikes me about all of your work is the the extensive labor that goes into creating them. Um, and we'd like to sort of move into some of your newer works now and sort of delve into that um, because they're, they look very different um, and yet they, they, they sort of maintain some of the same sort of threads in terms of, of labor um, and process. So your newer works that are on view in an exhibition right now um, in Santa Fe look very different than the works we're looking at here. And we'll dig into those a bit, but I would love to hear a little bit more about how this transition from the blackware vessels to your new body of work, sort of how that occurred and what similarities or threads do you see that connect these two bodies of work? And I'll, I'll transition to one of those works um, so that we get a sense of, of these as well. Um, yeah, so this is, this is quite, um, this is quite a leap. Um, mm -hmm. So as you both know, my, my um, career as a professional artist is recent and my tenure is really short. So it's only been about eight years since I finished school and five years of that were dedicated to the Blackware project. So when people see this new work and it's not ceramic, they're really surprised. Um, but like I said, I'm actually more interested, I, I'm more um, interested in, the, in ideas than I am loyal, particularly to um, a material. And to just comment um, on your question about labor, Addy, one mm -hmm. thing I do want to say about the blackware is that um, while it is a very laborious process, so I'll just point out to people who may not be familiar with it, mm -hmm. that, um, that it's, it's that shine on the surface is made by burnishing with a stone. There are no glazes involved. Um, that it's, it's never actually been my interest for the viewer to experience that sense of labor, mm -hmm. at least with the, with that project. Um, a Annie Dillard um, is a writer who I love, and she says this interesting thing, which is that you know if your reader is feeling is is feeling the how you have labored over something, mm -hmm. <laughs> then then you're not really succeeding as a writer. <laughs> and um, I've thought about that myself as well. I'm not sure that in in the case at least of the blackware that that my labor is is the point of it. It's not mm -hmm. how hard it is to make a plastic bottle facsimile out of clay. Mm -hmm. It's I'm interested in a lot of other ideas. But um, it, I, I guess I would say it's a little bit different as far as the new work is concerned, because as you'll see, um, one of the things I'm working with is embroidery, which is incredibly labor intensive. And I'm interested in sort of the minute domestic um, constant labor that white women have dedicated mm -hmm. to maintaining whiteness over the years. So mm -hmm. back to your question about the linkages. Um, so, um, the connections between that project and this new project uh, on the role of women in the domestic sphere and the reproduction of whiteness are not obvious. Um, and it, it took me some time to unearth that for myself to describe how um, my, you know, my trajectory as an artist can encompass all of these things. And so here's, here's actually what I've been realizing lately. One is that I like to work with the designed object as metaphor. So the plastic bottle, the neon sign, couches, dresses, family portraits, all of these things. Um, I, I'm working actually on wallpaper right now, um, you know, and it, you'll notice that it's not, I'm not saying that I, I'm, you know, making drawings or paintings or just, or sculptures in sort of the traditional sense. I'm actually interested in these, 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 um, I guess some of them are domestic objects, but these objects that we interact with in life. 
um, and outside of the museum. Um, I'm also realizing that I'm interested in icons. So my last body of work was organized by this constant reference to the plastic bottle is the most ubiquitous mm -hmm. vessel of my time, right? And um, in this newest show, you'll notice that I work a lot with the asterisk. And I feel like that was when um, things really came together when I started thinking about the asterisk as a metaphor for where we are in regard to whiteness. And I'll mm -hmm. talk about that more later. But I just have to say that one, most of my work in one way or another pertains to how humans use ideas about nature to naturalize human constructs. So I kind of talked about that as far as the blackware is concerned. But, and it may not be so obvious as far as, you know, my investigations into racism and sexism are concerned, but, um, you know, fundamentally, I'm talking about, you know, I'm interested in the ways that humans construct and use ideas about mm -hmm. nature to naturalize human constructed hierarchies. So mm -hmm. I'm talking about nature, nature here, but I'm also talking about our ideas about human nature. Um, so nature may not seem to have anything to do with my new work about the reproduction of racist ideas, but it actually has everything to do with it. Because racism is the idea that some humans are naturally superior to other humans, and that it's both, both natural and inevitable for humans to organize ourselves by phenotype. Mm -hmm. Likewise, sexism is the idea that men are naturally superior to women. And so alarm bells will go off for me whenever I hear anyone justify anything on the basis that's natural. Um, so I'll just transition now to, that was kind of a lengthy transition, but it has been a lengthy transition <laughs> between the two things. Um, do you want me, do you want to ask a question or shall I go on to talking about this neon sign here? Well, I, I'll just say, um, you know, what we're looking at here is part of an exhibition called Terms and Conditions that's up now at um, Gerald Peters Gallery in, in Santa Fe, is that right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so this work, as well as others that we'll discuss in a minute, um, deal head on with this, this issue um, of race, this constructed um, concept of race. And I think, you know, discussions about race and injustice are being held more, injustice are being held more frequently now and hopefully more productively these days. And so I guess we're, you know, I'm interested to hear from you how you see your work fitting in with some of these um, dialogues that have been happening lately. Yeah. Um... In 2016, uh, the year that the, a majority of white Americans across every demographic voted for a white supremacist president, I began to develop a new body of work about whiteness. Um, it, in a, a time when the Baroque racism of Donald Trump and his supporters had made it easier than ever for progressives to claim uh, racial innocence, it felt really important to me to interrogate whiteness, not as something that described them, the stereotyped white working class Trump voter, but is something that described me. And so as a provocation to myself to see the violence that inheres in whiteness, I made this big white neon sign that flashes between witness and whiteness. Uh, the violence of whiteness functions invisibly to white people. If anything were needed to confirm that I had lived in the world as a white person, it's that I should have to be provoked to see the unearned advantages conferred upon mm -hmm. me by a system of fake meritocracy designed to keep pe white people on top. This is something that I think that really came into consciousness last year um, with the murder of George Floyd. I think that there are a lot of white people who started to understand um, that we have a freedom to protest in a way that black people do not have the freedom to protest, right? That, um, that American, sees, American society sees um, black protest um, as terror and white terrorism as protest. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, this sign is as literal as it seems. Um, at that time in 2016, I felt like I needed this giant flashing neon sign prompting me to see it, see it, see it, see it, and to see it in myself, right? Um, to stop displacing it onto the, the Southerners, um, the, the, um, the people that I saw, um, 
you know, spewing overtly racist rhetoric at a Trump rally. But like, how is this actually happening within my own community, within my own, you know, upbringing? Um, so, and I also think it's interesting to note that whiteness is plainly manifest to all who don't inhabit it, right? So for people of color and indigenous people, the workings of whiteness are as obvious as a giant flashing neon sign. Um, I guess I'll just, I, I did want to add that, you know, uh, at the time, the time that my exhibition uh, was up at NIMWA in 2017 was um, that I think that we opened in February and I was there in preparation for it in January on the day of the presidential inauguration and also to attend the Women's March. And it, it was impossible not to notice that in the day that I marched with um, protesters at the inauguration, mostly with people of color, we were flanked by police in riot gear, we were circled by helicopters, there were snipers on rooftops. And then the next day um, with uh, marching with, you know, many fold more people at the women's march. Um, uh, I, mostly white women, we saw, I, I saw one policeman who was going to rescue somebody who had fainted and I, and I was high-fived by National Guardsmen on Pennsylvania Avenue. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, this is something that I, I couldn't stop thinking about when I returned home. And also the fact um, that all around Washington, I ran into women who wearing pussy hats who exclaimed about the size and the success of the march and um, also about how there were no arrests. And mm -hmm. as if it was our virtue um, that we weren't, or our goodness, or our ability to protest in the right way that was the reason um, that we weren't arrested. And I think that, um, you know, as the protests of last summer, um, or summer before last showed us around in response to the murder of George Floyd, that's really not what it's about. <laughs> you get arrested mm -hmm. because somebody wants to arrest you, not because you're good. Mm -hmm. You know, so I really started thinking about, you know, this idea of, of innocence and particularly women's innocence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I feel like that uh, might be a, a good transition to some of these, these uh, dresses you've created. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, so this is a, this is a project um, that's called She's a Good Person. And the story behind this um, is it comes out of my own family. So my mom's mom came to live with us when I was seven years old, um, around the, the time that my mother and father separated. And she was a, a vocally racist and anti-Semitic woman. And she was undeterred by my mother's constant reputation. Um, she also taught me to cook, a skill that has become integral to my adult identity. Uh, a few years ago, I did a project in which I attempted to record all of my implicit biases over the course of a week. Mm -hmm. And every time I had a thought that conflicted with my conscious beliefs, I wrote it down. Mm -hmm. And I ended up with this appalling document uh, that was full of sexist, racist, elitist thoughts that I did not believe. It mm -hmm. was like I had this sewer line running through my brain and the sewer line to me sounded a lot like my grandmother. I began to think about it as family inheritance, along with cooking and everything else my grandmother wanted to teach me. What would it mean, I wondered, to metabolize both her casual anti-Semitism and her oatmeal cookie recipe? What if one was literally baked into the other? Hmm. So uh, I, at that time, I cut up my week's worth of implicit bias and I baked it into cookies. I was thinking, this is eating me. Can I make you eat it? Um, on the recipe card that accompanied them, I replaced the all-purpose white flour with two cups of all-purpose white fear. So my grandmother was born in Detroit to a family of German immigrants in 1910 during an Amer uh, American period of contested whiteness and intense xenophobia. Um, industrial food producers capitalized on anxieties that stereotyped immigrants as unhygienic by marketing industrial white foods like flour with language full of racist connotations, such as pure, all natural and superior. So in 2018, I redesigned a vintage flour sack label replacing all purpose white flour with all purpose white fear, which I printed onto muslin and sew sewed into this set of girls dresses, like you might've seen in early 20th century family photos with the girls from babies to teenagers dressed in matching flower sack dresses. 
I wanted the work to address mothering and home as spaces supposedly innocent of ideology, but where white mothers and grandmothers are engaged in a, the very political work of transmitting the values of white dominance to children. Um, should we move on should to we, talking yeah, about the couch? Yeah. 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 Can, I, can, I, can I just say before we move on to that, I mean, I just, um, I just really appreciate your, um, Jamie, your, you know, your, your candidness, right, and your personalizing this work, right, and asking us as, as white women in particular, right, to take a look at ourselves and our own um, biases, because obviously mm -hmm. we have them, but particularly this, uh, this idea of, um, you know, the domestic sphere, which historically has been associated with women and kind of recognizing um, the, the dualities that can exist there of, you know, comfort, home, safety, those things, but also this, um, what can be a very insidious um, way to instill prejudices mm -hmm. in that family. Um, that family unit. Yeah, Jenny, you know, I, I, um, I can't help. Uh, lately, I've been thinking so much about um, the bumper stickers um, that are really common to see and the signs that I saw um, during um, the, pre the Trump presidency that said love Trump hate. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm really interested in this binary because I think it's a false binary, mm -hmm. you know, this idea that, that love and hate don't coexist or that love mm -hmm. and violence don't coexist. And, and um, you know, I think of like how much um, violence um, and violent ideology is propagated in the name of love of family, love of country, you know, um, mm -hmm. love of children, you know, and so one of the, the reference points for me with those dresses actually was, um, you know, thinking about my generation of queer people, when we came out, um, it was a really common experience to, you know, to, to um, have your mother cry you know, when, when, when you came out to her. So, and it was like, it's so lonely. I just didn't want you to suffer. I think this is also really, ha um, has been a common experience for interracial couples. So people in interracial relationships that, you know, you kind of get this warning from your mother. It's going to be so hard for you. This isn't what I wanted for you. And um, that we're accustomed to looking at as just like the ultimate expression of like protection and love. But I think we also need to look at those things as like policing, that is border work, you know, that is shoring up the boundaries of race and class and um, heterosexuality, all of those things. And that is like really important work. So it's like, I think that you know, this, this idea that mothers are, kind of, are, are incapable of violence because we're used to seeing violence as something that's gendered male is, is really an obstacle for us in understanding how we participate in, in perpetuating whiteness and mm -hmm. racist ideas. Yeah. Yeah. That was good. Uh, yeah. I just, I just want to say, just to echo, Ginny, I, I appreciate your sort of doing the work yourself to really reflect on your own, your own bias and, um, you know, and also just to be willing to share that and sort of um, talk about that, that sort of awakening in some ways um, with, with the world and, and with our visitor, with our viewers today. And I think um, we had a question that I'd love to talk a little bit more about this particular work, but I think this question really sort of ties into what we've been talking about Carmen is wondering what was the initial impetus for all for your self reflection, Jamie? Um, what was that sort of first defining moment? If you feel comfortable answering that question, I think our viewers would be interested to know. You know, it's um, it's it's a fairly complicated story. <laughs> um, actually, uh, the Blackboard vessels uh, really brought me into a kind of confrontation with whiteness because. Um, the technique that I use is associated with um, 
the ceramic production of two Pueblos in New Mexico. So Santa Clara and San Altifonso Pueblo, as you're well aware, because uh, my exhibition um, border crossing in 2017, um, what, at the same time, the museum also had a, a show of Maria Martinez's work, um, who is a famous, incredible potter um, from San Altifonso Pueblo. And she is the person who basically resurrected blackware um, ceramics and made it into a thing. Um, and so I became actually, uh, so I became really interested um, or, uh, well, it just became very complicated for me because there were questions being put to me often by white people about what my identity was mm -hmm. and, um, and kind of like, where are you from? Why are you using this technique that mm -hmm. has been made famous by these indigenous potters? What was the turning point for me? Mm -hmm. And honestly, um, this, what happened is this sort of confrontation with whiteness because there were these questions about my identity because the techniques I was using, mm -hmm. right? Which are regarded as as traditional techniques, but I will point our, out are actually, in the case of Maria Martinez, much more characterized by innovation than I think of as tradition. But mm -hmm. anyway, um, I have a mentor, Kirsten Buick, um, who said to me, when people are asking, you know, asking this question about your background, that it is an attempt to make my body, the artist's body, the explanation of the work. Right. Mm -hmm. It's an attempt to say that somehow like my DNA determines, you know, what art I should can and should make. And um, my, you know, I knew that some that, that I could answer that question by saying, well, you know, um, I'm half Mexican. My dad's side of the family um, is from Mexico. And um, but I also knew that that wasn't the real answer to why mm -hmm. I was making that work. And I didn't, I didn't want to be, participate in being racialized in that way for it to be my work being reduced to dot, great granddaughter of Mexican immigrants makes work about the border because there's so many other ideas involved there. But I also didn't want to disappear into whiteness. And, um, and so I, <laughs> it was just a, a time when I was really like having to look um, head on at whiteness and, and my access to it and what it had afforded me in my life um, mm -hmm. that had not been available to my grandmother and to my father for different reasons, right? Thank you. Thank you for answering yeah. Carmen's question. I know that it's it's a complicated one, but I yeah. it's, um, you know, it's important to, I think the lesson I take away from that story, Jamie, is it's, it's just a, yet another reminder for me personally that I need to, you know, not make assumptions about, about people based on what we see or what we think we see. And, um, you know, I think a lot of your work, work really addresses that, especially I think this piece, and you mentioned this idea of disappearing into whiteness. And I think that's an interesting transition when we're looking at this particular piece, your tete-a-tete. <laughs> yeah. And I'm hoping you can tell us a little bit more about this. And we have some close-up images. So just let me know when you want me to move forward to see those. Yeah. Yeah, great. So um, this exhibition, Terms and Conditions, um, it, with the exception of the dresses that you just saw, basically everything is white. And there's quite a lot of text in the exhibition, but um, also white text on um, white grounds. So you can see the couch here where um, you might just get the slightest hint that there's this embroidery on that seat back. Um, and behind you can see these lithographs that appear just like they're framed white rectangles. Mm -hmm. um, but in that case, there's actually um, white ink on white paper that um, also involves text as well. And there are four, I think, ne white neon signs in, in, um, in the show. And so this use of white on white for me is, is also this kind of this, a reference to the ways in, white, in which whiteness has, despite the fact that we live in a society that is organized by a racist caste system, that white people get to sit at the top of that system um, without any awareness of our participation in it or the idea that we have anything such as race, right? Um, I, you know, I think about how my generation, you know, it's really, if, if you talk to somebody my age, like they generally will say to you, well, I was raised not to see color, right? I mean, this is just the most, and, and then that can be like followed by a racist diatribe. Um, 
you know, those two things are not in conflict with each other. Mm -hmm. And, and so I, I was really interested in the ways that, um, that whiteness works in these ways that we are not accustomed to seeing, um, that are hard in particular for white people to perceive. Mm -hmm. So, um, specifically I wanted to talk about just the, what, what, um, where the ideas behind this couch though. So, um, so I had, while I've been focused on the ideological work performed by women and mothers within the home, um, my understanding was greatly expanded by this book I read, Mothers of Massive Resistance, um, written by Charlotte uh, Gillespie McRae. And um, in that book, she shows that far from being a history determined by the policies and laws of men, that American white supremacy is a system that was co-created by the work of white women who using the constructed political identity of mother expanded the domestic sphere far beyond the home into schools, policy and politics. And it's owing in large part to these women's constant labor that racial segregation survived long after the de jure or legal segregation was outlawed in 1965. Um, years before the Civil Rights Act of 1964, segregationist women were developing and testing colorblind rhetoric innovating a new conservative political language that disguised white supremacist values in the language of property rights, states' rights, parental rights, and constitutional intent. So it was this idea of white supremacist values that were couched in the political rhetoric of states' rights that formed the literal basis for this piece, tete a tete, as I envision it, the, the couch is a metaphor for white supremacist values, a kind of fair family heirloom that's passed down through generations, that's periodically reupholstered in rhetoric that's more harmonious with the political aesthetics of our time. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, when I originally conceived of this couch, it was, it was actually a, um, a, a different form. It was a Victorian couch. Um, and, and so I was studying the like Victorian parlor making, which is interesting in its own right. And I um, came across this form, the tete-a-tete. Um, it's also called the conversation chair. It's supposed to be a piece of furniture. It was very popular in the Victorian parlor um, in that it would uh, you know, allow a courting couple to sit and have an intimate conversation, but never touch. And, um, but what really struck me was the shape. So if you look at this couch from the top down, you see this S shape, which is also the same mark that's used um, within proofreading to um, indicate reverse word order. And um, so it, you can also use it to sort of, if a letter is transposed, right? Words, if words or letters are transposed, that, that you draw that S symbol around them to suggest uh, or to, to indicate that you need to flip the word order. So what was really interesting to me about this form is that, so I have on one side, and you can, I think, go ahead here, Addy. Mm -hmm. um, on, on one side, I've embroidered um, the word only, and on the other side, the word white. And um, I'm interested in really what's the difference between these two things, the de jure segregation of Jim Crow when, um, so I, I think of that era as a, a time of racial apartheid and or only white, which is what comes after where America begins to think of itself as a, a, a meritocracy, right? Um, and, but, you know, here we are 60 years later and much of the distribution of power, wealth and political access has not changed substantively, um, nor has the degree to which we're segregated. We're actually more segregated than we were during Jim Crow. And so um, this was, this couch was about sort of asking this question of, of where are we sitting exactly? And also, um, you know, there's really the implication that, you know, that, that white, white folks have been comfortable sitting on both sides during this, mm -hmm. in, you know, during this time period. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, have the, and have the privilege to be comfortable on both sides. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think it's, it's really interesting to me that, you know, even though material conditions haven't changed substance substantially over the last 60 years um, from uh, it, when you compare it to Jim Crow that the majority of white people were pretty comfortable with this, this world in which um, 
the people in power, the people with money, uh, the artists in museums only happened to be white, right? Mm -hmm. They were only white. It wasn't because of a prohibition, which was white only, that was Jim Crow. But the fact that, that now supposedly it's because um, these people deserve to be, be there because they're the best people, you know, um, mm -hmm. um, that they happen to be there. There hasn't really been an appetite for true equality. And then, and then I, I, you know, have been thinking a lot about how once we get a black president, um, once Barack Obama is elected to the highest office of the land, there's a whole contingent of white people who suddenly find that, you know, that it's important to be really explicit and be like, no, we actually meant white only, you know, mm -hmm. America's for, it should be for white people only. So I'm interested in that, you know, the shape of this couch is a reference to that kind of flipping back and forth. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And then it's just worth pointing out too that the floral motif within um, the, these were, these, the letters is made up of asterisks. And um, the asterisks for me are, you know, I use the asterisks repeatedly in the show in multiple artworks. We'll look at one more. But for me, it's about kind of footnoting um, all of the histories that have not made it into the main text. Right. One of the things that that um, segregationist women were doing was determining what the narrative would be about the South and related to the Civil War. It's because of the work that they did with mm -hmm. schools, um, uh, training teachers, essay contests, um, textbook review committees, all these things that, you know, now more than half of Americans think that the Civil War was not fought over slavery, but this thing called states rights. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I'm interested in, in like all that has been buried through that work. Um, I'm also interested in the asterisk, you know, as this sort of footnote to so-called meritocracy where white people get to stay at the top. Um, okay. So here we are looking at, um, this, this, um, this, this sign, this neon sign is called terms and conditions. And um, terms and conditions, um, so this, this, this neon asterisk actually came to me because I was really thinking, you know, this, this exhibition is organized around this idea of domestic space. And um, I was so happy to have this space that had a fireplace and this mantle, mm -hmm. um, which I really, I realized was this perfect opportunity to, um, you know, to sweep away basically, you know, so in the place of, on the mantle of, the family heirlooms, the ancestors, the forefathers, the the masterworks of art, uh, the the cross, you know, all of these places, things that might appear over the top of a mantle um, to 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 take that, you know, to in its place, um, place the asterisk because I think it, it feels to me like this symbol for where we are with regard to you know, all of those categories of people who have been able to reside in that place comfortably and without being questioned, right? So um, this is a time where white men are starting to get a little bit uncomfortable because uh, we're started and, and their legitimacy is starting to be questioned, right? Like now, now is the time where we can't any longer talk about George Washington or Thomas Jefferson and not talk about the fact that they were slaveholders, mm -hmm. you know? Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's um, all of these, you know, all these aspects that have just been taken for granted in terms of white living and white history, um, in my mind, all have this asterisk attached to them, which is not only like sort of an exception to this so-called legitimacy or, um, you know, the idea that they deserve this place of honor, but also to indicate all of the his all the stories that have not been told, all of the histories that have been submerged. Um, mm -hmm. And I, you know, I feel like it's this, I feel like this is where I, we are in this moment in relation to, to whiteness. And I include in that my own whiteness, which is, I feel like asterisk, you know, it's just like right now it's the time to be digging into the histories, but it also feels like it's, it's this time where things could change. It feels like a, a placeholder, mm -hmm. um, like um, this symbol that represents a certain degree of openness um, in terms of what could be the future of whiteness. 
um, what could be the future of, of this society and where are we going? It's, it's, you know, we don't have to be optimistic about it necessarily, but I do think that there's, there are some possibilities there. So that seems like it might be a, a good place to stop in terms of this exhibition. Yeah, I appreciate you talking a little bit about the asterisk, that piece in particular. And during our initial conversation, you talked about it as um, some, in, in some ways, a glimmer of hope for what there is to come, right? It's just sort of this complicated symbol for you. But I, I, I do, I'll, I'll stop sharing. I think we'll see if we have any questions, but I had one more question for you, Jamie. Sure. Um, I'm wondering for those, for those of us who are watching and trying to educate ourselves more about racism in this country and how to combat it, I'm curious if you have any recommendations for what you've been reading or listening to or watching lately that you feel like um, people should really sort of invest some time in. <laughs> yeah, I have so many recommendations. Um, I, um, so there's a book by Eula Biss, um, an amazing essayist called Notes from No Man's Land. Um, I, I also can really recommend a book called Racecraft um, by <laughs> Barbara and Karen Fields. Um, it has been really instrumental in my thinking and my understanding about um, the way that racism, it's actually racism that creates the idea of race in our society, mm -hmm. not the other way around. Um, there's a book by a philosopher, Linda Martin Alcoff, um, called The Future of Whiteness, mm -hmm. um, which was where I was first really able to think about, you know, sort of this historical context of identities and the, and, and the fact that they're not fixed whiteness over the course of, you know, of history from when it was invented to now has transformed um, many times. And so um, that helped me to understand the, or gave me a way to think about like possibilities for how whiteness can be transformed as opposed to just sort of disavowing it or distancing mm -hmm. myself from this, this identity that I clearly inhabit. Mm -hmm. um, Anything by Claudia Rankin, so her book Citizen, um, and yeah. there's a newer one called Just Us um, that I really recommend. And lately, my favorite is um, Tressy McMillan Cottom. Um, she, her book of essays is called Thick, um, but she also does a podcast with Roxanne Gay that is called mm. Born to Slay. Yeah. And she is just like, I find her to be just, awesome. and when it comes to talking about, um, about caste, about status, about like how we inhabit all these complex categories. I feel like mm -hmm. she's just one of the smartest people thinking right now. And I'm so happy that she's now in the New York Times as a columnist. Yeah, thank you for those recommendations. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, th I mean, obviously this is a, this is a, you know, such an important and interesting topic. And, you know, Addie and I had the pleasure of discussing with you last week too. And, but I feel like we could go on you know, ad infinitum here. <laughs> it's, it's always such a pleasure to talk to you. Um, I actually, I actually said the same thing of you to a colleague last week. It was like, I think she's one of the, the smartest people I have ever talked to. The way that you, the way that you think about things and the way that you are able to get at them visually is really just, um, you know, not, not just visually stunning, but also so profound and meaningful. Mm -hmm. That is a huge compliment, Jenny. Thank you so much. Jamie, yeah. thank you so much for your time. And we just, you're so gracious um, with your, your willingness to sort of share what you've, what you're processing personally and, and how that sort of evolves into your work. Um, so I want to thank you again. And I want to thank everyone who tuned in today. Sorry for the little technological hip hiccup. Um, we hope you'll join us for our next episode of NIMWA Exchange on Tuesday, November 9th at 12 Eastern. Our topic is the unconventional late 19th and early 20th century French painter, Suzanne Valadon. Um, you can learn more about her works in NIMWA's collection and hear about the special exhibition Suzanne Valadon Model Painter Rebel on view at the Barnes Foundation in Philadelphia through January 9th, 2022. Register today. Uh, I think that Laura is putting the link in the chat right now, and we hope to see you next month. Jamie, thank you so much. I uh, hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Thanks, Addie. Thanks, Thanks, Jamie. Jamie. Thanks everybody. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.